Okay. Okay, my wonderful students, let's get going. And welcome to Wednesday class for climbing the mountain. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about some energy uh, concepts, but before we do that, I want to give you some uh, news on grading updates. Uh, first of all, uh, the boxcar homework six uh, that I graded is ready to be returned. So let me. So for those of you that didn't get it last on Monday, uh, come on up. Uh, so it's uh, let's see, L's and M's. Starting with, plus I have somebody that didn't put their name on it. I have no idea who that is. Uh, so uh, Vanessa Lomas, or Lamas, and all the way to uh, Mikhailova and Niven, Emma Niven. And, just come on up, everybody, from L through N. Uh, Vanessa Lamas? Vanessa, are you here? get my specs. Uh, Maximilian Lambert. Are you in uh, Mola's lab? No. The grader? Okay. Uh, Danielle Lawrence. Danielle. Uh, Rachel Lena. Rachel, where are you? Oh, there you go. Michael Leskowitz, Taylor Leslie. Taylor, are you Taylor? No. Uh, hold on, hold on. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll hand it to you if it's Shaq Juan Lewis. There you go. Kevin Lynn. Uh, James Lawrence, Taylor Loblack, Taylor, very good, very good. Uh, Sebastian Laurette Demola, Christiana Lovo. Okay. Here you go. Seth Lucas, okay. Matthew Macaluso. There you go. Alexis McGee. Okay. Nice jacket. Shannon Manuel. Benjamin Manns. Matthew Martell. It's a hammer. Morgan Mathis. Elma Medic. Uh, Elizabeth Medina, Medina, uh, Anastasia Mikhailova, Mikhailova, okay. Daniel Miller, Chelsea Minor, Leanne Meyer, Dominique Mobley, Gina Musia. Christian Nguyen, Emma. What was your last name? Lawrence. Danielle. Here you go. I don't have yours. Oh, maybe that's the one without the name. Is this yours? No, that's not mine. I had mine in uh, black pen. Must be in the other pile. Uh, no, wait a minute. This is no name. This is mine. No, I, uh, I don't have any Lucia's. That must be in the wrong part. 
You're supposed to be in my file. Did I already give it back to you? Oh, you might have. I just I don't know if you said my name or not. I don't. I didn't, I didn't really hear you that well. The homework. Yeah, that, I don't want to. Hear. No. Okay, then I must. I must already have. Okay. All right, students. If you. If. Okay, the more you talk, the, the less homework you're going to have. Uh, if 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 your name, I got a I got a paper up here that has no name on it. So if if you're in my group and you, I didn't call your name out, uh, come on up after class and see if you can identify it. Uh, also, I have uh, Scantron printouts from exam one that you can pick up. We'll do that after lecture uh, instead of going through that list again. Okay, so the boxcar homework six. Now, I have grades for everybody else, but I haven't posted them yet. Uh, but I will be doing that. I'm kind of hamstrung by the fact that I have to use this Windows computer, which is driving me bonanza. But I will be getting my MacBook Pro back, they say, uh, this week. So uh, anyway, so we'll just be patient with that. But I got all your homework. And then I got a bunch of... Uh, Homework four, homework three, and homework four that I have to post. So we got a lot of stuff to post. Um, I've started reviewing exam one written scores. Okay, and remember I asked you to give those pages back, and many of you have done that uh, with your two written problems, one for four points, one for eight points. Um, and I have uh, reviewed the scores of everybody with last names A through G this morning. And I actually uploaded it um, into the grade book. You may have noticed it if you're in this group. Uh, but anyways, there's no uh, those discrepancies. Uh, we're just double checking some of the scores. But this first group, everything looks kosher. There's more to come. So uh, just be patient with me on that. You may see that uh, updated by the end of the uh, by the end of the week. All right. We have clicking updates. Uh, what is the drop ad, or what is the uh, withdrawal, the W? It's, it's late? 20th. So that's after spring break. So if, you get, if I get all your stuff updated and squared away and righteous uh, over spring break, then if you, hopefully nobody in here is, is thinking about taking a W, but if you are, uh, I'll try to get all that squared away over spring break, if not sooner. You know, as I said, I'm kind of hamstrung by this Bill Gates special up here. Uh, all right, so uh, is there anything that you want? Is there any question grades related that you want me to review? Yes. No. Uh, what I'll do is I won't be able to check it. So you, you have the score right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question was, if you didn't turn in your two, your your one page with problem on the front and problem on the back, total of 12 points possible, uh, you can, if you do find it, you can turn it in, and I'll double check it. If you don't find it, the, you know, the grade will stay. And so far, nobody's grades are changed, so we're just, you know, I'm just being, uh, as they say, in uh, in the law lawyer's office, from an abundance of caution, uh, trying to double check uh, grades and stuff. Uh, another question. Any kind of grades question? Okay, let's keep going. Um, I, I have this comment. You might want to jot this down. And I suspect that this is from somebody screwed up in group me. Because I saw a huge number of people with this exact formula, and it's bad. It is completely wrong, and you lost points if you used it. All right? You were trying to use this, but you didn't quite know 
what you were doing uh, to get delta P for the boxcar X uh, and the elapsed time of interaction delta T. So you use this other formula, which is crap. All right? I mean, there's no other. So whoever, whoever put that, is the first person to type that in on GroupMe, you can track them down after class and, uh, you know, deal with them. Question. Yeah, the question is, would you have used the two different velocities to calculate the change in momentum? And the answer is yes. And so, but but see now here, look at this. Um, this has got a trace of something righteous. You know, the mass of boxcar X, 10,000 kilograms, right? And then there's an attempt at a delta V, which is what you were asking about, and that is correct. However, delta P subscript X or M delta V, MX times delta V subscript X, um, which is what this other equation is attempting. Uh, those are good, but you have to do it right. The final velocity, remember, when you have a delta, it's always final minus initial, whatever your delta in. You know, it's a difference, the final or the later minus the earlier or the initial, right? So this thing has a subscript I mean, this is Apple. Boy, I'm starting to sound like my mother. <laughs> apples and oranges. Don't mix apples and oranges. But anyways, this the numerator here is mixing apples and oranges. V subscript X. Okay, what that tells me is, uh, and that's the capital X, uh, the uh, velocity of the X box, boxcar X, but which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the, first, the initial or the final? And then, the, the, then subtract, and then V subscript F. Well, first of all, V subscript F is out of position, and you don't even know what you're, which boxcar you're talking about, at least in that formula. And I took points off for that. Okay? And T on the bottom, no, it's not some time value. It's delta T. Right? It's an elapsed time. It's an increment of time. Right? So as you can see in the, in the other equation, this is what you're looking for. Go ahead and jot this down if, if, I, uh, if I embarrassed you on your homework or if you know you used the, the uh, group me monstrosity. And let that be a word of a caution, caveat emptor. For those of you that are on group me, I do not recommend it for this very reason. Somebody types something in. Oh, yeah, man, that'll. And then somebody says, yeah, I, that worked. But what they really mean is I used that and then I fooled around with it and I got something that I think works, but I don't really know because it's not graded yet. All right. So if everybody starts doing that, you end up in the fiat. I saw dozens of people, not just one or two. I saw dozens of people using that formula. So it's. You know, I, so I know everybody was copying off somebody somewhere, all right? Because you can't have that that much uh, identical work, you know, by accident. It's it's got to be traced back to group me or something, all right? So, anyways, this is this is what you want: the change in the momentum. Okay, does this answer your question? You have uh, final x velocity right here inside the parentheses minus uh, initial boxcar x velocity. And then the mass of boxcar x and then delta t, the interaction time. So that's what you want to use. Not the, not this mess up here. I mean, that's, that was really bad. And I'm a little bit ticked off because uh, of so many people what it tells me is you weren't thinking, you were flailing. And it looked good, so you went with it. And that is exactly what you do not want to do, especially on my exams, because I'll, I'll burn you to the ground, you know, uh, on a test if, if that's what you're... And, you know, engineering students, they do that all the time, you know, because engineering, they, they're used to looking up formulas. You know, when you're a professional engineer, you know, you remember stuff that you use all the time, but if you don't, 
you go and look it up. So that's the culture that they're used to. And they're also used to memorizing stuff. But if you memorize something like that up there on top, that's ba- baseless or bogus, um, you're going to be in a heap of trouble if I write a, a very difficult test. And we got difficult stuff coming up, so let that be a word to the wise. All right. Any questions in addition? Additional questions about this? Yeah. What's that? Mass of the Xbox car. Mass of Boxcar X. Yeah, that's what that means. And it's capital. I've capitalized it so it's not coordinate X, which would make sense. The mass of the X coordinate, yeah, that doesn't make sense. So I made a capital X. All right, now I want to talk about this uh, work business here. And I'm going to direct you to some additional reading uh, inside of... Uh, the uh, textbook, our free textbook. Now we know that this formula up here, F parallel times delta S, that means the component of the force, the net force, that's actually parallel to the displacement delta S, no matter what you got. Now if you're on a ramp like that blue ramp, uh, that's got a, you know, it's basically a right triangle, the um, component F parallel whatever it happens to be, you know, 2.73 newtons or something, down the ramp, you know, the, and that's the uh, W parallel, that's the, the weight par- uh, parallel component of the weight force uh, down the ramp. That's going to be constant on a per- plain old ramp, all right? So you have delta, so you could, so your delta S is, you know, you, you, you calculate F parallel times delta S, then you go to your next increment, and you do F parallel times delta S, and then you go to your next one centimeter segment, F parallel times delta S, and then so on and so on, and you get ditto marks all the way down, and if it's a, if it's a plain ramp like that, F parallel is going to be a constant. All right? And so really, the the sum of all the delta Ke's, all the changes in the kinetic energy, um, inch by inch, centimeter by centimeter, millimeter by millimeter, whatever size you make your delta S, are going to be the same if you're on that blue ramp. Now, if you're on the ski jump down below there, uh uh-uh, you don't have a constant F parallel. And we've talked about this before. Up here towards the, let me get my cursor down here. Come on, cursor, where are you? Where is that? Okay, so up here towards the top of the ski, uh, the ski jump, all right, uh, F parallel is almost 100% of the weight force because it's, it's almost perfectly vertical up there towards the top. And if you ever go on a ski jump, that's the way they do it. You know, they make it really steep at the top and then it looks like you're, you know, way high up in the air, you know, because the cameras, you know, in, you know, in the, you know, TV, the, the wide world of sports or whatever, cameras are focused on the skier. And he looks, it, it looks like he's, you know, 900 feet off the ground, but he's not really. He's only about 20 or 30 feet because of the way they shape the hill, you know, so that they shape the hill so that it kind of follows the trajectory, the parabolic arc of the, so that, when he, if he falls out, you know, if something goes wrong, he's not going to fall and, and totally kill himself, only semi-kill himself. So, but at the top, it's really steep, so you can get a good amount of speed. But then down here, come on, cursor. Down here, of course, you almost got jack because you're almost leveled out down here at the bottom. So F parallel for each delta S along this path is going to be changing. Go ahead and write that in your notes. F parallel is not guaranteed to be a constant. It may be a function of position on the path. If your path is a right triangle ramp, it's a constant. But if it's anything with any kind of curvaceousness to it, you're going to get, well, I mean, if it's a weight force anyways, 
you're going to get variation. It's going to be trigonometric. You know, so you, and, you know, due to ski ramp, you'd have to know the equation uh, of the ski ramp surface. You know, it'll, it'll be, it'll have some um, x to the second power. It'll probably have some x to the third and some, probably some x to the fourth. It looks like it's a, a quarter of a circle, you know, like 90 degrees of a, actually, it looks more like 90 degrees of an ellipse. Okay, and that's just because the, that's the only curve I could make in, inside PowerPoint. I mean, if I was on my Mac, I would have made a, a much nicer curve. But, uh, but on that one, every, every time you calculate F parallel delta X, you have a different, different, you have a different F parallel. Right? So there's variations on that. So as a function of S, your position along the path Okay, delta x being a, an increment of that coordinate s along the path, uh, you're going to have to calculate a different f parallel. All right? And if you've ever seen that movie, uh, Hidden Figures, that's one of the tasks that they, you know, they're trying to calculate uh, reentry uh, trajectories for the Mercury capsule with John Glenn in it and stuff, and they're double checking it uh, with a human. Uh, Catherine Johnson. And one of the things that they do in there is that they're calculating this very kind of calculation. You know, something times a delta S. Except for them, the delta S is in this, uh, this enormous trajectory through the atmosphere. Just like what we saw with the space shuttle. You know, the, uh, those capsules, they probably didn't start to deep orbit over the Indian Ocean but they probably started over the Pacific Ocean. I'm sure you could look it up. And they might have been similar to the space shuttle, but I think the space shuttle, what did I read? The space shuttle comes down a little bit more slowly, as I recall. So it would have to start in the Indian Ocean. And the, uh, the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo capsules, and the Soyuz capsules of today, Dragon, uh, crew capsule will probably take a much quicker descent. But at any rate, uh, you're doing these F parallel times delta S all the way through. Because you got an enormous amount of kinetic energy. You're trying to figure out, you know, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, how much does my, how long is my heat shield? For instance, on John Glenn's first orbital flight for the United States, one of the things that happened was one of the buzzers or one of the alarms for a strap that uh, for uh, the heat shield went off and it was a false alarm, but they didn't know that. So they thought, oh, my God, the heat shield is is loose. So they didn't know if John Glenn was going to uh, burn up on reentry or not. OK. And so what they did was they just kept. Uh, some of the some of the material that they had strapped in over the heat shield, the retro rockets for maneuvering and stuff, uh, they just kept that strapped in. He was supposed to jettison that before reentry. They kept it in, and all that stuff ablated off. It all burned off on reentry. But you know, when you're when you're trying to design a capsule with a heat shield that will last all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean for pickup, and not fry out and and incinerate your astronaut halfway down, you got to know how much energy you're dissipating through the heat shield through, you know, so it's very complicated, but you know, it's, it's something that they all have to do. Now, the reason I bring that up that the force can be variable is figure seven, three and figure seven, three part a, if you look at that, this is a, you know, this is kind of a, a let Oh man, this stupid word, Microsoft crap. Oops, that's on YouTube. <laughs> Cuss, I'm cussing at Bill. G well, he deserves it. <laughs> Anyways, so this top one is like the ramp, all right? The the force f cosine theta. Forget about cosine theta because it refers to another diagram. But just say that the force. You know, that's a, a, a diagram where you're calculating F parallel times delta, uh, delta S, except here it's labeled D. So for dis some distance, all right? 
Uh, but it's, it's a constant force. You know, so many, you know, Newtons. And so the, the red line at the top of that rectangle is equal to the force, you know, 2.7 Newtons of W uh, parallel on a given ramp, you know, for a given object, right? And then F parallel times delta S is actually the area of that rectangle, right? Now, down on the bottom, uh, figure B here, now you've got a, f a variable force. Now, this one's kind of cinchy because it's a straight line variation. That ski jump would not look like this. The ski jump would look curved. Okay, so this is kind of an intermediate, but it is varying. And the way that you do it is you estimate it with those little rectangles. Each one is, you know, like a centimeter of delta S. And then, you know, the, the height, so you go up to, you know, you make your rectangle a certain width, and then you sketch it in up to where your force comes across. And then you take, you know, like the midpoint of where the force curve, that red curve, the black curve, uh, cuts across the top of your red rectangle. Okay, and then you calculate that. And then you go to the next one. And then you go to the next one. Now, the, the way that you do this on a computer is you do it on a computer. And f raise your hand if you've had calculus class. If you, oh my goodness, quite a few of you. This is an integral. You're calculating the area underneath this curve. And this is how you do it numerically. And what Katherine Johnson was trying to figure out was how to, you know, how to do this numerically. And she did it, you know, they did her, she basically had a, a, a bunch of fancy adding machines. She wasn't on a regular computer. So she was double checking this big monster IBM computer that, they, they didn't, that John Glenn didn't really trust. He trusted Katherine Johnson. And so, but it's basically this. This is called, uh, it's got some fancy names, but it's something that we, we uh, physicists do all the time. Numerical, just estimating the area underneath that curve. And the area underneath that, and it's not much of a curve, it's a straight line, it's a constant slope. So that was kind of cinchy. Uh, you can, and, and you know what else? On this one, you could actually do um, a triangle and a rectangle to do this one exactly because it's a straight line. But if anything's curved, you know, you just do your rectangles and, you know, estimate and, you know, you're either above or below the true value. But the closer you get, the better, you know, the smaller your, your delta S's are, uh, the, the more accurate you're going to be. Question. Yeah, the area of it you could do for this one, yeah, you can use, the question was, can't you do the area of a trapezoid to get the exact area? And the answer to that is yes. It's just like a velocity triangle that we were doing earlier in the semester. You know, starting with a certain amount of speed and then building it up at a constant acceleration. Okay, and figuring that out, yeah, it's basically, you, you split up your uh, trapezoid into a triangle, you know, the, the very top of the area. And then below that, a rectangle of some kind. So in other words, a trapezoid. Uh, but if it's curved, you know, you got to do other things. And if it's curved, you can use trapezoids. Uh, but you got to do build different trapezoids each time and stuff. And basically, you got to be Katherine Johnson to be able to do that. So she's pretty awesome. Uh, and all those guys down there at, at NASA. So, so that's what we got going here. So this, this lower one, when you have a f variable force, you're talking calculus, all right? Now, we're not supposed to do any calculus in here, although many of you have had calculus. So, but what, when we get to look, working on the work done by a spring, you know, a spring that goes back and forth and oscillates, an oscillator, uh, incredibly important problem, but also kind of easy and there's some calculus in that that I'm going to refer back to this diagram, all right? And it'll, you know, and you'll you'll be able to understand the results of that by remembering, you know, when we bring it up without doing any calculus, if you can remember this diagram here, all right? Now, uh, here's another diagram that I want to review with you, and this one is an, an amplification of gravitational potential energy. 
minus mg delta y. Go ahead and write that formula down. This one is encoded with the minus 9.8 meters per second squared in the symbol g. All right? And we have a minus sign out in front. Now, if we were doing the work done by gravity in free fall, you know, when you're coming down, gravity is doing positive work. You're gaining more and more kinetic energy. All right? So mg is your weight force. Delta y is negatory. All right? So mg is downward. That's negatory. Delta y is negatory because you're going down. So mg delta y, the work done by gravity, is positive on the way down. All right? You're gaining kinetic energy. All right? Now, on the way up, it's the opposite because delta y is positive. All right? So delta y is positive. Mg is still downward. They're opposite directions. So you have a minus sign that doesn't cancel with anything. So your, your work done is negatory, and what that means is you're losing speed. You're losing kinetic energy. Delta Ke is negative. You're losing kinetic energy. You're losing speed on the way up. And then, of course, when you get to the very top, you've lost all of it, and you start coming back down again. Now, uh, Rachel, question. No, you do have to. In this symbol, I'm saying that that is not replaceable with 9.8, but with negative 9.8. And still the negative 9.8 in front of the MG. And still the negative in front of the MG. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, that was another error I saw a lot. A lot of you guys, I should have put it on the, on the slide, but I didn't. Uh, I, I dinged a lot of you guys uh, for not using negative 1.1 meters per second for boxcar 7 correctly in your formulas. You just willy-nilly put minus signs in there. And then you ended up uh, having, a net, uh, having the reaction force backwards. You know, there's an awful lot of people that had a, a positive rightward uh, reaction force on boxcar X. And that would have that sped up boxcar X. But boxcar X slowed down, way down. So it had to have a, a reaction force uh, back to the left. And many of you uh, biffed that. Uh, anyways, um, so minus mg, so, so the work done by gravity would be regular mg delta y. Go ahead and write that down. Work done by gravity is mg delta y with a minus 9.8 in, in, in place of g. Okay, right. mg delta y. Now, the potential energy is the opposite of that. And, and Rachel, that's why we put that minus sign in the formula out front. So there's one out front explicit, and there's another one implied, implicit, uh, in the symbol g. All right, so you've got to keep that in mind. All right, now what this means is, if you're going upwards, delta Y is positive, G is negative, and then this minus sign makes everything positive. So on the way up, minus MG delta Y increases. Kinetic energy decreases by the exact same amount. So make a note of that. The gravitational potential energy increases on the way up, joule for joule, with the kinetic energy decreasing. So whatever the kinetic energy loses, it goes into altitude. And it basically goes into delta Y. All right? And that's why, you know, it, you know, when the shuttle's landing, they're basically trading altitude and kinetic energy, you know, and, and, and then trying to ablate all that, that, you know, all that extra energy uh, into the atmosphere as heat, which they have uh, famously done uh, amazingly. Uh, the space shuttle is an amazing machine. They're all retired now, but boy, oh boy, if they ever have to come out of mothballs, quite a machine, yeah. So on the way down, you just use regular Yeah, so on the way down, let's look at that. If delta, if you're on the way down, okay, 
Delta Y is negatory, and then you got minus, minus 9.8, so that's negatory, and then you got a third minus sign out in front. So now you got negatives all the way through. So that thing is negative. You're losing potential energy. You're losing GPE because you're gaining kinetic. All right. It's saying that the ground is zero or wherever, you know, you can set zero to be anywhere you want, but usually the ground is, is good, you know, or maybe, you know, the, the long straightaway on this picture might be a good place. And then this dip right before the straightaway, you know, that'd be like minus, you know, two meters or whatever it is. And then the top of it would be, you know, like positive six meters or something. All right. But, you know, as long as you're consistent, you know, set the zero point wherever you want and then you and then use this formula and you'll never go wrong. All right. Now, I'll give you a little secret. It, pr probably nobody in here has ever heard of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of spontaneous symmetry break. See. In the. They have this gigantic atom smasher over in Geneva, right? At, well, at CERN, the, the, the European Center for Nuclear Research. You were there? Man, it's a big, I'd like to go over there and visit. It's a big atom smasher. And what they're trying to do is find the Higgs boson. Now, the Higgs boson is something I know all about, right? And it, it arises through spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, the interesting thing about this is, you know, I didn't even think about it when I chose this. The interesting thing about spontaneous symmetry breaking is it, it requires a, a potential energy diagram or it envisions a potential energy diagram exactly the upside down version of this. Where you have a really big dip and then you have a, a, a you know, and then this, this over here is actually a bump. And, and then there's an intermediate level over here. And what the universe does is it, the, the entire universe or the, the, the Higgs field does, raise your hand if you've heard the word quantum tunneling. Okay, you've heard, you hear about it on the sci-fi channel, but this is real. This is real, my friend. So quantum tunneling in the spontaneous symmetry breaking process of the Higgs boson in the early universe is what gives rise to the mass of all the other particles in the universe. And uh, they think they found it, but you know, it's, it basically, well, I'd like to tell you more about it, but this is physics 2053, not physics 3101. That's where you'd learn about it. Anyway, so you, you up here, here's what you, here's what you want to think. Raise your hand if you've been on a roller coaster lately. I mean, in like a universal or whatever. Now, raise your hand if you remember that at the very top of the tallest bump, you were really going slowly or even stopped. Is that, is that what they normally do? Okay. So kinetic energy zero up here, potential energy maximum. Because it's the biggest delta Y on this whole run. All right. Now, where's it going to have most the, the biggest amount of kinetic energy at the bottom down here. So this is where you puke your guts out. Well, anywhere along here, you, you're probably going to be puking. You know, I used to be afraid of heights. And I forced myself to go on a roller coaster up in Canada. And uh, I got and So I sat in the front seat of the front car. And when we got to the top, I just, you know, I'm sitting up there. And I looked over the edge, and oh my goodness, it looked like a wall all the way down. But after that, I wasn't afraid of heights, so it's pretty good. But anyway, so you got your maximum kinetic energy down here. So this whole, so the whole deal here is, no matter what the shape of the roller coaster track is, the one variable that you need to keep track of is elevation. You know, relative elevation, delta y. And then once you get that, you can figure out kinetic energy. I mean, so if you know, so for instance, if you, where's my cursor? Okay, so if you know the mass of this 
train up here, this train of cars. If you know the elevation, you can figure out its potential energy up there, mg, minus mg delta y, all right, relative to the, you know, to the run at down here. And then you can figure out minus mg delta y down here. The difference will be um, kinetic energy. So, if, so all you need to know is y, the vertical position. Now, we're going to have some written homework this week. And I have some special, yeah, we're, we're going to dismiss now. Um, so your instructions for homework seven are the following. Now, listen carefully. I don't want anybody up in the back row that's not paying attention. They're looking at Facebook to come up dry. First of all, I'll post it tonight or maybe tomorrow. Yes, maybe tomorrow. And it's going to be due on Monday. After spring break. So, no class on Friday. You get that up there? All right, you're dismissed.